very much everybody for joining today. Today we have the uh, pleasure to hear uh, Professor Jose Juan Blanco Pillado. And he will talk about uh, cosmic string networks and gravitational waves. He's an expert on this. He did his PhD under uh, Alexander Vilenkin. That uh, to those of you who uh, uh, you know doesn't know about that, I mean Vilenkin is you know the expert on these things. And then um, he was faculty at Tufts in the U.S. until 2012, and then he moved back to Spain and he is now part of this, um, is, is it like a, a rich research center, the Iker Basque, or is it That's like right. a, <laughs> this yeah, is a science foundation? Like a foundation, the foundation for science. And uh, yeah, so uh, whenever you want to uh, start, uh, it will be a okay. pleasure. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, you can hear me. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction and for inviting me. Um, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to be here, even, even though I'm just virtually there. Uh, so today I will talk about uh, cosmic string networks and gravitational waves, as the title says. Recording. Oops. Okay. Everything okay? Yes. All right. Um, so this um, talk is about some work that I've been doing over the years. It's not just the recent work, even though I will talk about some, some of the work that we are doing right now. But this work has been going on for, I don't know, uh, 10 years at least. And this, was, uh, this has been done with uh, many people, uh, in particular with Ken Olum at Tufts University, also a, a postdoc there, Ben Schleyer, uh, also a, a faculty member that was uh, previously associated with Tufts as well, Xavier Siemens, uh, Jamie Walker, and uh, and as I said, this is a compilation of uh, several papers that we wrote in the last few years. Okay, so uh, let me start by giving you the outline of the talk. Uh, first, I'll start by uh, doing a very brief introduction about cosmic strings and their dynamics. And basically I, I will focus on the things that are important uh, for the rest of the talk so everybody uh, knows the, the things I'm going to be talking about. Uh, then I'll explain the particular details of uh, cosmological networks and um, uh, how we do these uh, simulations. Um, then I'll focus on the main topic of the talk, which is the stochastic background of gravitational waves produced by these by these objects. Uh, then I'll describe how we can use uh, observations from this stochastic background or the lack of, of those observations to either observe cosmic strings or put or put some uh, some bounds on, on those uh, on those models. And then I'll end up with some open issues and conclusions. Okay, so let me start by, by a very simple introduction. What is a cosmic string? What am I talking about here? Uh, so what I've been talking about mostly is uh, a soliton, a topological defect in field theory. Although people talk about cosmic strings, uh, sometimes they talk about uh, these objects, these topological defects, which is the main topic of my talk. But sometimes, and in fact, I think I have one slide about cosmic superstrings. So uh, what are cosmic superstrings? These are just the, um, the fundamental strings of string theory, which we normally think as tiny because we think that they are quantum objects that represent particles, right? But in the course of the expansion of the universe, maybe these strings could be blown uh, to cosmological sizes. And in that way, they could behave classically, not, not quantum mechanically. And therefore, they would behave like uh, uh, cosmic strings. So there are models of uh, cosmology uh, within string theory that produce these cosmic superstrings, and therefore, uh, some of the things I will uh, talk about could be relevant for those models. But for most of my talk, I will talk about defects. Um, uh, I will talk about the strings as uh, solitons in a field theory, uh, which are very similar to the ones that appear in condensed matter, for example, in, in superconductors, we know that if you have uh, superconductors and you, you put a magnetic field in the superconductor, let's say in the, in the z direction, the magnetic field does not enter you know, homogeneously the superconductor, but it enters in, in, in tubes, in, in fluxes, right? And those uh, fluxes, um, um, 
you can uh, find the solution of the uh, of your Landau Gisbert theory uh, that describes these objects as as solitons, right? So the same kind of object can exist in many extensions of the standard model, many uh, theories beyond the standard model, and uh, and and these are the kinds of things that I will that I will talk about mostly today. Okay, um, so just to completely uh, fix ideas here. Let's just think about the simplest possible model where one of these strings can happen. Uh, so I'm going to take, a, a, for this example, a complex scalar field phi um, in four dimensions with a potential which is uh, given here. Um, so it's a potential that is normally called Mexican hat potential, right? Uh, and the only thing I want you to remember from here is that it has a U1 symmetry. Uh, meaning that all the minima at the bottom are the same value of the potential and they are basically uh, parameterized in a circle in field space, right? Uh, and the other thing I want you to remember is that there's only one scale in the problem which has to do with energy, which is eta, uh, which basically uh, gives you what's the value of the, uh, of the potential at the top of this Mexican hat uh, potential. Okay, so how do these uh, objects appear? Well, if you have a symmetry breaking potential of this form, um, here I represented two different things. On the left, I represent the field theory space, the one I, I, I produced before. And so I now have the same potential, but with colors. And on the right, I'm going to think about real physical space, okay? A two-dimensional space, which is a two-dimensional slice of a three-dimensional universe, let's say. So if I think about uh, a process that uh, creates this um, Mexican hat potential and there is a symmetry breaking, then I can have uh, 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 everywhere in a space, uh, a field that is constant and is in a vacuum, which is described by this blue color, right? But of course I can also have the same situation with the red color or the green color. And from this point of view, all of these are analogous um, vacuum. They are as good as the, uh, one as is as good as the other. Now, uh, if you put this in a cosmological context, um, we know that uh, the universe, uh, because it's expanding, it has a horizon. That means that in different parts of uh, uh, of the space, as the universe is expanding, if there is a symmetry breaking of the pro of the kind that I described before, um, the different parts of the space which are not causally connected. Uh, do not have to be uh, all going to the same phase, right? Uh, and this is particular. This is represented in this figure here, where I put three different points with three different colors. So this is all fine, except that at some point the universe is expanding, and all these all these points are going to become causally connected. When they come, when they when they are causally connected, they have to agree on what is the value of the of, of the field, right? Uh, now, of course, uh, there is no preference of that, that says that the blue is better than the red or the green is better than the red. So what happens is when all these regions come together, they agree uh, to all go to the top of the potential. Okay, But we know that the top of the potential has some energy associated with it. So it seems that this uh, configuration, which is the lowest energy configuration given the boundary conditions of the field winding around the vacuum manifold, is going to store some energy at the, at the center, right? And this is what is called normally the vortex solution for this problem, for these models. Now, if you extend this to three dimensions, you can continue this in three dimensions. And then you see that there is some region in the center where there is some energy density associated with the top of the potential, right? So this is exactly the, the string that, uh, uh, that we, are, we will be talking about, okay? Okay, so what are the basic properties of these strings? Well, they are topologically stable. It means that, um, as I said, it's the lowest energy configuration with uh, the given boundary conditions at infinity. So once this object is, is produced, it cannot just dissolve itself. The energy is going to stay there, okay? It's, it's a stable. Also, it's a stable in the sense that if you have a long string, it's not going to break because uh, you know, the flux uh, has to go somewhere. So you cannot break unless you have monopoles in the theory, but let's assume we don't. 
Um, but of course, you can have only infinite strings, so you can have loops, uh, places where the string sort of um, creates a, a closed uh, circle. So these are the kind of strings I will be talking about, things that are stable and things that have no ends. Furthermore, I will be talking about uh, strings whose properties are such that the tension is the same as the any density per unit length. In other words, this is a Lorentz invariant object, okay? Um, this is important for the rest of the talk because that means that um, the typical uh, speed of propagation of things is the speed of light, right? Um, this is quite different from your normal shoelaces uh, where the any density is much higher than the tension, okay? And the tip, if you wiggle the shoelace, uh, the typical propagation of the waves is not the speed of light, it's much smaller. Um, and as I said, this is also going to be crucial for the rest of of my talk. And finally, I will only talk about models that um, that only couple to a one massless uh, field, which is the graviton. So uh, of course you can uh, um, consider other type of strings where you violate this, for example, in global strings, uh, you can have some other decay channel, but this changes the phenomenology. So just to set the uh, simplest possible model, I will concentrate on strings, which only coupled to gravity as, a, as the only way to decay. I mean, they could decay into other massive particles, the ones that are making up the string themselves, but they are massive, not massive, or not massless. Okay, so these are the basic properties of the string that I will be talking about. As I said, you can complicate the model uh, further by violating any of these assumptions or all of them, but this is going to complicate the phenomenology. So it was. I will just uh, describe the sort of simplest possible model, the vanilla strings. All right. Okay. So with this, within this uh, set of models, uh, what are the important things to keep in mind? Well, the first thing that I mentioned is that the the, the vortex that I uh, described before uh, is based on a potential that has one scale uh, of energy, which was eta. So, what kind of uh, energies are we talking about? So normally we are thinking about granified theories, uh, theories beyond the standard model. So the typical scale for granified theory was uh, always thought to be 10 to 16 GV roughly, right? So let me just think about this as the nominal scale uh, and see about uh, what are the properties of these strings. So the thickness of the string is inversely proportional to, to the square of this uh, symmetry breaking scale. So, um, so the typical uh, thickness of this thing is microphysically small, like particle physics is small. It's 10 to minus 30 centimeters, okay? On the other hand, this, these objects uh, could be uh, extremely large because they could be infinite, meaning they cross the horizon, or they could be as large as, uh, you know, a galaxy or even, you know, any size. Now, for this granified theory scale of 10 to 16 GeV, if you compute uh, the uh, density per unit length of this object in normal units, it gives you this number of 10 to 22 grams per centimeter, okay? This is a huge, huge number. Uh, you, can, you can imagine that if you have a string going straight through the earth, so it has a diameter of the earth, and you compute what is the mass of this object, it has the mass of the sun, okay? So you would concentrate on a 10 to minus 30 centimeters uh, thickness, a line um, of the size of the sun, of the earth with a huge amount of mass, okay? So these are huge numbers. Just, I'm just giving you this to give you some ideas of why this is important for cosmology. If you also put numbers in terms of tension, real tension, it gives you also a gigantic number of 10 to 37 newtons. So the picture that you should uh, be getting from here is that if I think about uh, an object being produced in some phase transition in the early universe, maybe associated with Ranified theory, these objects are going to be around today because they are stable uh, and they could have a huge amount of mass and they could be moving relativistically. Okay, so you can, you can already see where I'm going with this uh, is going to be uh, I'm, I'm basically describing an object which is perfect to produce um, uh, gravitational waves, right? Excuse uh, me? Okay. Yes. 
Is a standard model Higgs potential also applicable here? Say it again. Standard model Higgs potential. The standard model Higgs does does yeah well I mean um, the standard model Higgs as it is would would not produce uh, cosmic strings uh, because at least not a stable cosmic strings because it doesn't have this property of uh, having the vacuum manifold to be just a circle so this is more complicated than that. So they are not going to be a stable strings in the standard model, but you can complicate it. The, the, the model of the Higgs, if it's not just the, the standard Higgs, uh, then you can produce uh, 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 strings, okay? So unfortunately, the standard model does not seem to have a string. So that's why we are thinking of uh, things beyond the standard model, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see. So one thing that I, uh, as I said, there's only one parameter, which is the symmetry breaking scale. Uh, so in the rest of the talk, the, every time I talk about what kind of strings I'm talking about, I'm almost going to say, what is the any scale at which they are associated? And this is normally described with this parameter, G mu, which is the ratio between eta, the energy scale of the string, and the Planck mass. Uh, because of this uh, ratio, of course, this is a square, because this ratio is always small, right? So G mu, uh, uh, what I want you to remember is that G mu is always going to be small. If I take 10 to 16 GeV, this number comes out to be 10 to the minus 6. But as we will describe, um, we can go even lower than that. I mean, um, so for the rest of the talk, uh, I will parameterize all the models by this parameter G mu, and this number is small. Okay. All right. So, um, what is the cosmological setting that I am thinking of? So, I describe a model where I describe the field theory that uh, allows us to have these objects in their spectrum, if you want. Uh, but of course, to have something in the spectrum doesn't mean that we will have a, a good enough number of them in the universe today that we can observe them. Um, However, I, I, I want to argue now that this is uh, actually the case. And this is uh, an argument that goes back to Tom Keeble in 1976, where he basically said that in a, in a phase transition, as I said, different parts of the universe uh, are going to be costly disconnected. Uh, and the fact that, there, that you can compute how, much, uh, how many of these uh, regions uh, we should have today allows us to put uh, a, lower bound, a lower bound in the density of these strings today, okay? So uh, at least uh, when they are formed. And this, uh, this number is, is non negligible as we will describe later on. So there is a hope that we can uh, have enough of these strings today or throughout the history of the universe that they become, they become important. Of course, the other thing that we don't want is to have these strings um, dominate the any density of the universe. We don't want to have them have a problem like the monopole problem, right? Um, so one uh, simple way to fix this problem is to assume that the phase transition that produces the strings happens uh, uh, in, in a way that, uh, that the, the any density of those strings is not, uh, it's never going to dominate this. And we will describe in a second how this happens. Uh, another important thing that we should do is to have this uh, symmetry breaking scale uh, or this symmetry breaking process happening after inflation. If it happens before inflation, all the strings would be diluted away so much that at the end we may have, you know, maybe a small percent probability of having one string in our whole Hubble patch. Therefore, it's, it's probably impossible to observe it. Of course, you can, you can play a little bit with this and, and tune the density of those strings if you want, but I will not play this game. I assume that the phase transition happens after inflation. And this naturally happens in many models of inflation, for example, in hybrid inflation or in string theory. There's also brain inflation that produces these objects uh, after inflation. Okay, so I, I discovered the model in field theory that has these model objects in their spectrum. I now argue that they can be produced with numbers which are interesting for cosmology. So let me describe now the dynamics of these strings. So the dynamics um, of these strings, which are the simplest ones, that they don't have any structure, uh, they don't have, we, I'm, I'm assuming that they don't have any degrees of freedom living on them. 
uh, the way to describe the motion of these objects is by generalizing the idea of uh, a relativistic particle, right? A relativistic particle we just described is dynamics by looking at the world volume or the, or the world line of the particle. And here, what we do is describe the action as the uh, wall sheet um, of the of the string. So the string is a line, um, uh, but in space time, it describes a wall sheet like a two-dimensional object living in four dimensions. Uh, we can parameterize this world sheet uh, with two parameters, one space-like parameter, which I call here sigma, and another uh, time-like parameter, which I call here tau. So the action is just uh, the area of this, uh, of this world sheet, and it's multiplied by the only, the only other parameter in the problem, which is the tension of, of the string. As I said, the tension in the DNA density is the same. So, uh, by the way, this gamma here is the induced metric uh, on this wall sheet. So hidden inside of this gamma are my variables for uh, the position of the string, which is this vector x as a function of sigma and tau. So this is the thing I want to find out the equation for, this x of sigma and tau. Okay. Oops. Um, okay, so th this action has a lot of uh, symmetry in it. Um, uh, which in turn means that we can use some uh, interesting gauge conditions to fix the gauge and simplify the equations of motion. In particular, a usual gauge that is used in cosmic strings is the, so the so-called conformal gauge, where uh, we pick two conditions. The first one, let me start with the second one first. The second one says that x prime, which is the tangent vector of the string, is uh, is perpendicular to x dot, so x dot is the velocity. So that means that the only velocity that makes sense is the perpendicular velocity of the string, okay? Um, meaning that if you have a straight string, since there is nothing that parameterizes the string, there is no sense of motion along the direction of the string. It's only, it's only motion perpendicular to it. And the other uh, gauge condition says that sigma, uh, which we are allowed to change by different reparameterizations. In this particular gauge, sigma parameterizes the, the energy per unit length. Okay. So using these gauge conditions, we get uh, an equation motion, which is very, very simple. It's the one that is, by the way, do you see my cursor? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay, good. So the equations of motion are very simple, are just the wave equations, right? So we can solve this equation in a generic way uh, as, as traveling waves moving in one direction or going in the other direction along the string, right? Like as any solution of the wave equation. And the only thing that we have to do now is to fix uh, the, the gauge conditions by imposing that these two functions A and B, uh, when you take the derivative with respect to their parameter, they are normalized, okay? So this is a very simple, uh, description of the string. You can, uh, after the talk, you can go and create uh, many solutions for A's and B's, and you get many uh, string uh, motions if you want. Very simple. Now, the only other thing that you have to take into account is the possibility that the strings uh, cross themselves. Uh, so, for that, we have to know how, how this interaction what was the result of that interaction. And people have simulated this in field theory and they realize that what they do, what, what, what happens is that this string is exchange partners, which is this process that is described here. When the string uh, sort of cuts itself, then um, the, the, two, the two lines of the string sort of change partners. Now, this is very important for several reasons. One of the reasons is that now you can see that you had the one only, you started with you started with only one long string that self intersect itself and produce a loop. And this is going to be very important for the rest of the talk because uh, loops are going to play a crucial role in my talk. The other thing that I want you to remember is that every time this happens, there is a, a, a kink that is produced. A kink is a discontinuity in the tangent vector of the string. Okay, this is just because when you cross two strings and you Reassemble them. I mean, reassemble them by uh, exchanging partners. You create this this kink. This is also going to be important for later. Okay, so 
what are the dynamics then of loops? Well, I have the general solution for my X as a function of A and B. The only thing I have to do now is to make, a, make it into a closed function because this has to describe the position of the string, which is a loop. If you do this, you realize that uh, the, the solutions of these uh, loops, they are just uh, periodic solutions. So basically the idea is that a loop uh, basically oscillates uh, the, uh, in a periodic fashion, right? Now, this may be what you already had in mind when you were thinking about uh, strings with tension. If you imagine that you, have, you start with a circular loop, okay, at rest, and you say this loop has tension, of course, this loop wants to shrink, okay? And then, of course, what happens is that it comes back up after it has crossed itself, and this can continue uh, forever. So this is the simplest possible solution of this uh, of these equations, but there are many more, as we will see later. So the important thing is that the solution is periodic. The loops oscillate because of their tension, and typically they move relativistically. Okay, this is just because, as I said, the energy is the same as the tension. This induces that the traveling waves over the speed of light. So typical speed of the string, any point is close to the speed of light. However, it's also important to realize that there are specific points where the, 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 the description in Nambugoto says that the string moves at the speed of light. Uh, we can see this very easily. We have here the solution, the general solution, right, at the top. And we can calculate the modulus of the velocity vector, x dot. And this is basically one half b prime minus a prime. But these two functions are functions that live on a sphere because they are both normalized to be one. So it can happen that b prime is equal to minus a prime. Okay, when these two things happen, remember a prime and b prime have modulus one. So if a prime is equal to minus b prime, then eventually here you have twice the same thing divided by two is this is just the modulus of a prime or the modulus of b prime, which was one. So if a condition like this would happen, the stream would move at the speed of light. Okay, and this is a point on the string evolution that is called a cusp for the reasons I'll explain in a second. So here I represented uh, this sphere, which is called the, uh, the cubal Turok sphere, um, which uh, is supposed to represent a unit sphere, a unit radius sphere. So the functions a prime and b prime, as I described before, because of the gauge conditions, have to live on this sphere, right? They are normalized to live on this sphere. So um, imagine that they cross on this sphere, then a or, or imagine that you, you draw minus a prime and b prime, and imagine what happens when they cross. Well, what happens is that the string, as you approach this point, uh, has this particular shape, sorry, has this particular shape, and you can see that if x dot is equal to one, the next prime is going to be equal to zero. So it seems that at that particular point, the string has to be doubling, doubling back on itself, and this is the shape of the cusp. So here's a simulation of um, what would happen uh, when we are uh, uh, close to the moment where a prime is equal to minus b prime. So here I put the string and I color it by the local velocity. Okay, so let me see. So the string doubles back in itself and there's a point where it was red. Okay, let me just do it again and try to stop it when it's supposed to be. Oops. I don't know why this happens. Okay. So this is roughly the point where the string doubles back on itself. And the point at the top is moving at the speed of light in a transverse direction. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, the moment of a cusp. Uh, this object does not, I mean, you don't have to, uh, to work very hard to find one of these objects. For example, you can find one of these solutions, which is called the burden solutions and it's an exact solutions for this loop. And you look at their evolution and you see that there are, in this particular case, I think there are two cusps per oscillation. So first of all, you see that the loop is oscillating periodically, but also it has these points, which are basically the same as the one that I represented here. So typically in a smooth loop, uh, you will have uh, one or two of these objects or these cusps per oscillation, okay? Okay, so why am I talking about loops so much? Well, loops are very important, are sort of the protagonist of my story, as we will see in a minute, but it's, it's, they're also very important even before that, right? 
because as I mentioned before, we want to have a model of cosmology that is not ruled out already by the by the fact that the any density in the strings uh, was the dominating one. Uh, so how can the network lose enough energy uh, to, to allow for this possibility of not dominating the any density of the universe? Well, this is because of loops. So if you have to imagine the network as the one that I, I have in my, my background, as these things evolve, and I, I put some movies later on, you will produce loops. These loops start uh, oscillating, and they're oscillating as they are oscillating, they are losing energy by gravitational radiation. Now, this is exactly the signal that I will I want to compute, and I will compute at the end of the talk. But for the time being, it's just a way for the whole network to lose energy, right? If you didn't have this sort of channel of energy decay, uh, uh, the way to decay its energy, the network would dominate the energy density of the universe and would be a complete disaster for uh, for cosmology. So loops are very important, not only for, for, for a signal of uh, strings, but also to make the whole idea of a network of strings to be cosmologically viable, okay? Okay, but we want to compute the gravitational radiation. Uh, we want to see strings by this gravitational radiation. So uh, you can do a back of the envelope calculation to see what is the power emitted by a loop by just uh, you know very rough calculation. And you realize that it's just given by g mu square times a number that has to do with the geometry of the loop, right? People have done this calculation. I'll explain more in a minute. But, but for simple loops, this gamma number is just over the order of 50 to 100. So this is the power, the, the, the rate of energy loss, if you want. <coughs> so the mass of the loop, you can parameterize the mass of the loop as the mass of the loop as the time it was formed, let's call it T prime, right? Minus the power uh, of uh, gravitational radiation multiplied by time. So this is how the mass of the loop uh, decreases as a function of time. Now, if the loop uh, mass is decreased, it also means that the length of the loop decreases. So the length of the loop is the, the initial one minus gamma g mu times the time it passes from the moment of formation till till well till later so this uh this equation already tells you something important if you look at uh this equation uh you realize that as i mentioned before g mu is something to be is a number which is going to be very small right we said uh, to be 10 to minus 6 or smaller gamma is of the order of, the, uh, of 50 or 100 uh, so that means that the time um, that has to pass before this second term is, is of the order of the first one is very, very large compared to L, right? So this is all dimension is, right? Uh, what this means is that uh, if you have a loop um, and you want to ask uh, how long does this loop, uh, uh, for how long can this loop oscillate before it completely uh, decays or radiates all its energy, uh, the answer is, uh, is is a very long time compared to its period. In other words, it's like one over g mu times its period. If, if, if g mu is very small, that means that the number of oscillations that this loop is going to, to, uh, to do before it completely disappears is huge, right? So the loops are not going to be produced in the network and disappear right away. They are going to be oscillated for many, many times. And during the, all this oscillation, is losing energy for gravitational waves very, very slowly. I hope this is clear. So at the beginning of your talk, you said the string is topologically stable. But right. now you are saying gravitationally they become unstable? No. Well, uh, what I meant is that the, a straight string is gravitationally, uh, sorry, is um, topologically stable, uh, meaning you cannot make it disappear. This is an object whose I mean, it's the lowest energy configuration given the, the boundary conditions, right? Now, the moment that you make this into, into a circle, if you look at the infinity, the boundary conditions are now trivial. So now this loop can shape to nothing and disappear, right? It's okay, the, yeah. Maybe a simplest version of that is in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. If in two dimensions, I put the boundary conditions at the infinity, I get a vortex, right? And this cannot disappear. However, if I now put a vortex and an anti-vortex, and I look at the infinity, the boundary conditions are trivial. 
and they of course can annihilate each other and leave behind just radiation, not not any topological number. Okay. 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 So the long strings, the network, uh, they are stable. They will keep producing uh, loops. The loops, uh, once they are formed, oscillate, emit gravitational radiation, and eventually disappear. Okay, this is the picture. So of course, what we want to do is to capture uh, the the spectrum of the stochastic gravitational uh, background, which is uh, the combination of the, all the gravitational waves produced by the whole network, and also throughout the history of the, of the evolution of the universe. Now, there are other ways to see strings, and for example, as I described before, uh, cusps are very violent events, right? Uh, so one of the ideas that uh, was proposed by Thibault de Moore and Alex Venkin was that maybe uh, if we were lucky, we could be in the way of one of those uh, cusps, in the direction of one of those cusps, and then we would have a burst of uh, gravitational radiation. I'll concentrate today on uh, talking about the stochastic background, but this is also a very interesting idea that we should explore. So how do I calculate this stochastic background? So normally people that describe gravitational waves, uh, they choose this uh, quantity omega, which is the uh, fraction of uh, energy in gravitational waves, and they produce it as a function of the frequency. Okay, the, the typical thing that you see, you know, many different sources in the same picture, a different spectra. So we will do the same thing here. And in order to do this uh, calculation, uh, we have to have some ingredients and do this integral. Um, now, the ingredients uh, are in this integral are mostly two. So I'll, well, first of all, one of the things that I will not uh, do anything special about is the cosmology. So A of T is the scale factor as usual. So I'm gonna take the normal cosmology. When I mean by the normal cosmologies, we will have a radiation radiation error first, a matter error, an error later, and maybe a cosmological constant uh, domination afterwards. So I will not do anything. I will, I will just do the standard cosmology there. And of course, this enters in the calculation because we are integrating uh, all the possible gravitational waves that were produced throughout the history of the evolution of the universe. However, the ingredients that are important for this model, which are specific for this model, is the number density of loops. Okay, which we need for any moment of time, but also we need them as a function of their masses or their lengths. And the other ingredient that we need is what is the power spectrum of gravitational waves produced by a typical loop, by, a, by an average one, right? If you, if you know both of these things, what is the density of loops of each size? And what is the gravitational waves of, uh, of what is the spectrum of gravitational waves that each of these loops produces? It's clear that by summing up these things, you can get the final answer of the stochastic background that we get today. This is what this expression uh, is supposed to represent. So, uh, so the idea is now to use simulations to get uh, an answer for both of these things. Okay, so let me start with the first one. First of all, it may seem that this is a, a hopeless problem because is not only that you need to know the density as a function of time, as any moment of time, but also the different distributions. So this, this seems to be extremely complicated because we cannot simulate a network of strains for the whole range of evolution of the universe, right? It's a huge range of uh, scales, so we cannot cover that. Uh, however, we are lucky in the sense that the, the strains, so the string networks reach a sort of a steady state um, um, solution, which is called the scaling solution. And this scaling solution has a very nice property that uh, basically says that all the statistical properties of the network just scale with the horizon. Meaning that if I give you a picture of the network at some time t, uh, and then and some and then, and then another picture of the same network has as it has evolved. Um, and a picture of the network when the, the horizon was twice as much, twice as big as the first picture, uh, then uh, to basically roughly by looking at the pictures, you would say, well, this looks the same as if I take the original one and I just stretch it by a factor of two, okay? Um, 
Now, this also means that the n density in, in the this is scaling solution also means that the n density in the strings and if in the strings uh, is a constant a ratio of the n density in the background. This is also important because it's also telling you that um, you will not have a monopole problem, that the n density of the, of the strings will never become dominant, but also that is never going to be sort of negligible either, right? The fraction of the n density in the strings to the n density in the background is fixed. This is very important because it allows us to uh, say that if you do a simulation and you get to this scaling solution, that's it. You don't have to keep simulating. The only thing that you have to do is to now stretch everything by the expansion of the, the horizon uh, to calculate things much later on. Okay, this scaling solution allows you to extrapolate uh, even though you have done very small uh, uh, range in the simulation. Okay, so we've done such a simulation. This is what is presented here. Um, Excuse me. Uh, yes. May I ask one naive question about this string uh, scaling so scaling behavior? Uh, does it depend on the uh, like nature of the strings? Like if it is charged or it has some right. global charge, then it also follow the same scaling uh, nature. Yeah. yeah. So so if you add if you add more um, more ingredients, for example, for global strings. Mm -hmm. um, then the story becomes more complicated because uh, there's a there's a debate going on now about global strings to see if they reach uh, a scaling solution in the way they presented here or if they have some logarithmic uh, dependence on on time mm -hmm. so so yes depending on the things that you add to this picture that i described today you can you can change this scaling solution but i think most of the models that i know of even though you add uh, add ingredients, when of course, of course not. If you if you take superconducting strings, which are strings where uh, you have degrees of freedom living on inside of the strings, mm -hmm. uh, you can create a problem that uh, th that is important because um, one of the stories that I said is that once the loops are produced, the loops are going to be decaying, right, by gravitational radiation. Mm -hmm. If you have one of these um, objects, this is loops with a current inside, mm -hmm. uh, this current can stabilize the loop. Mm, for example, you can kill the, the tension of the object. If you kill the tension of the object, then the loop does not decay, does mm -hmm. not oscillate anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, now it, because it does not oscillate or, or decay, uh, it looks like a particle, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you create many of these loops in deep in the radiation era, Mm -hmm. They are going to dominate the energy density of the universe uh, right away. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, you know, a complete disaster for the network because I... they, they would become the dominant uh, energy density. So this is so, so called the Vorton problem. Um, but yeah, this is a different uh, model from the one I'm mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. So basically, the scaling solution can apply when the string doesn't have any, any such interacting nature. Like it, it must be singlet in a sense. Right. Uh, well, I mean, I, I just gave you two extremes uh, of mm -hmm. the situation where there is no degree of freedom and everything is uh, what I said. Mm -hmm. And the one with superconducting exchange where things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, in the middle, I think uh, there's maybe some room for, for, for mm -hmm. uh, a scaling solution that does not go uh, bad before today, I guess. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. So you can have a small amount of current, a very small amount of current that would not change the network uh, mm -hmm. properties. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So as I said, the scaling solution is is great because it allows us to extrapolate the results once we we know the statistical values of this scaling solution, right? So so the the goals in the simulations is to find these values of properties in the scaling solution. So we set out to do this simulation a long time ago, and um, I presented one of these movies here. So what you're seeing here is um, uh, the initial conditions for our simulations. Now, there are many strings here. 
because these are supposed to represent the initial conditions where um, uh, basically the string has a random walk uh, type of uh, behavior and uh, they are colored by length. So you can see that it's dominated by one single string that goes many, many, way, many times across the box, which is this huge infinite string. But then there are loops also, and I think they only count for the 20% of the energy of these initial conditions. So these are the initial conditions. Now we are going to evolve them using the Nambugato equations of motion, right? We know exactly how to evolve them. Uh, and the only other thing that we have to take care of in this simulation is every time the two strings see each other and interact, uh, we have to perform this sort of uh, exchanging of partners. Okay, so this is what you're going to see here. Oh, by the way, in this, this is also an expanding universe in the radiation array, I believe. Sorry, what did so, you say? The radiation era, right? Sorry. Did you say that it was during the radiation era, right? So. Yes, it's the radiation era, yes. Thank you. So you see that the network gets diluted by the expansion of the universe. And the other thing that you will see, or that you see is that there are loops that are being produced, but then they disappear. For example, this green one, well, this one self joins again the, the, the long strings, but the red ones that get produced, they oscillate a few times and they disappear. Of course, this simulation is non bugotto They cannot disappear. What we do is we take them out of the simulation. We remove them. The reason to remove them is because once they are, let me just do it again. Once they are produced uh, and they are small, as I said, the evolution is just going to be periodic, right? So there's nothing to be gained by, uh, uh, by keeping them in the simulation. There's nothing, they are not gonna do anything. They're just gonna be evolving like this forever but they are going to take a lot of computer resources. So what we do is to take this loop, we take these properties, we log them in some file, we put in some file uh, to study later, but we don't uh, give them in the evolution of the network. And we have tried to keep, uh, to do some simulations with them inside of the simulation and nothing changes in the terms of the scaling solution or the pr properties of the loops. So we believe this is a perfectly reasonable uh, thing to do. Okay, so out of this, uh, we can compute the properties of the long strings, the density of long strings and all these things. However, to get the network to produce loops which are in the scaling solution, we had to do a much, much bigger simulation. And this was one of the breakthroughs in our simulation that we, we had a parallelized code and therefore we can run for much bigger, bigger simulations. So this is, we didn't run this simulation that I show you. Uh, we run one that is two orders of magnitude bigger. Okay. Of course, I don't show you this because uh, if I show you the big one, it's just going to be completely opaque. You will not see anything at all. But it's important that you do a huge simulation because the network takes a much longer time to reach the scaling solution in terms of loops than in terms of long strings. Okay. So this was. This was needed to, to compute the number density of loops. And this is, this is the result. The number density of loops uh, as a function of time in the scaling solution is given by this expression where we have already taken into account that the loops lose energy by, uh, oh, sorry, there's a G missing here, capital G missing here. Um, so this expression takes into account the fact that loops lose energy by gravitational radiation. And from the simulation, we can get the normalization. This 0.18 is the normalization of the density of loops that you have uh, in this scaling solution. Took a, a huge amount of computer resources just to get this number right, but I think we are confident that this is correct now. Okay, so this allows us to compute this number density of loops for any moment in time and for any, this, for any different sizes. So we have one of the ingredients down, let's go for the other one which is the spectrum. So how do I compute this? Well, um, the first thing that uh, to remember is that the, the loops are periodic sources. So periodic sources emit gravitational waves at particular frequencies, at discretized particular frequencies that go like two N over L, where L is the, the length of the loop. Now the sum of the power emitted at each of these frequencies is what we call before gamma, right? Capital gamma is the total power which is the sum of the power emitted in each individual loop. 
But we are interested in both things. We're interested in gamma because it's going, it's going to enter in the way in which the loop uh, decreases its length. But we, we also interested in the different, uh, the ratio between the uh, power emitted different frequencies, because this is going to be important in the calculation of the, the power spectrum at the end. Okay. Um, in order to find this typical power spectrum for loops, we need to know what is the shape or typical shape of loops. Okay, why is this important? Well, if, if the loops are dominated or have many of these cusps that I mentioned before, um, these cusps are going to produce a huge amount of energy into the high uh, frequency regime. Okay, uh, The power spectrum uh, you can calculate it for cusps goes like n to the minus four thirds, where n is the, uh, if you want the, the, the number, um, well, this n over here the number that describes the particular frequency. So the higher the end, the higher the frequency. So this, this is a frequency dependence which declines very slowly, which means that you have power even for very large frequencies, okay? Which of course are coming from uh, the, you know, the tip or near the tip of the, uh, of the cusp. Another possibility is that you have many kinks instead of cusps. And these kinks also have some uh, dependence, which is different from cusps. So it's clear that we need to know the shape of uh, loops if we want to know if the power spectrum is going to be dominated by some frequency or some other frequency. And this is going to be important because different power spectra would affect the final power spectra on in terms of omega sub functional frequency. So how do we calculate or how can we know what kind of loops do we have? Well, the good news is that we have all the loops we want because we have you know, a huge number of loops coming from the simulation. So here I'm just giving you a movie of one of them. This is a random loop uh, obtained from the simulation. So you see many things in this movie. One of them is, well, this loop is not a smooth. It's made out of many different elements, right? Well, this is because the loop has been uh, uh, produced out of strings that have been cutting themselves or with some other string many, many times before. By the time you ensemble this loop, uh, it's made of many different sections, right? That's the first thing. And then, by the way, the color here describes the, the local velocity. So red, I think, is the highest speed, and blue is the lowest one. So you can see that there is a huge variation, not only in the direction, the tangent vector, but also in the speed uh, of the loop local speed of the loop. Well, another thing that you see is that while I've been talking, this loop has been oscillating several times, right? So as I promised you earlier, the loop uh, has uh, periodic uh, solutions. So this is a particular solution from the, from the simulation, and it's indeed periodic. Um, now, this is a very particular loop in the sense that it's a non-self-intersecting loop, right? A loop, if you try to do it yourself with the recipe that I mentioned earlier, um, if, you, if you do it, uh, you will find that most of the times that you do it, a loop that you start is going to self-intersect and then produce two, et cetera. If you want to find a non-self-intersecting loop, you are, you're gonna have to work a little bit harder. Now, the network, the simulation, if you want, the network works for us in that sense that it produces many, many loops and most of them self-intersect, but from time to time, they're not self-intersecting loops. These are the ones that are important for us because these are the ones that are gonna be sitting there, oscillating for millions of times, emitting gravitational waves, okay? And we have uh, these loops. These are the ones that we logged into this number of the density of loops that we are going to use the calculation for, okay? Sorry, why the small loops don't, you, you neglect the small loops. You say that the small loops. No, no, no I, I, don't, I don't neglect them. Um, I, uh, I, in the simulation, you mean? Yeah, so the, you say that for, for the signal, only the big loops are important. So why the small loops right. are not important? Well, I didn't get to that, but uh, um, this, the, the answer is, is correct. Um, but uh, Basically, when you do the whole integral of the network, 
uh, you realize that uh, the um, the even though the any density in small loops in terms of energy for the network, it's important uh, when you calculate the total energy density producing gravitation waves. The important thing is the is the ones that are uh, bigger, bigger in the sense of the scale in solution. So it's not uh, you know, divided by the by the Hubble. I don't think it's a uh, there's a simple way to explain it just by the dynamics of the integral. I, I, I can explain with more detail later, but uh, at the moment of the simulation, we take them, we take them all. We don't neglect them. We we lock all of them in our uh, in our um, in our files, and then we compute this uh, number density from all of them, big ones and small loops, all of them. Okay. Now, at the end, when you do the co the convolution of this with the power spectrum to calculate the whole, I mean, the result of the of the whole network, it turns out it is true that the, the most important uh, contribution comes from large loops and not the small ones. Maybe, maybe this will become clear later, but at the moment, I haven't discussed this yet. Okay, but the important thing is that they have to be non-self-intersecting. This is uh, key, okay? Uh, if you take the ones which are, uh, I mean, if you don't, if you are not careful, um, if you take a B1 and you compute the gravitation wave from a B1, but then this, this loop uh, breaks into two or four or many of them, the result of the gravitational wave radiation that they produce is very different, so. That's why you should concentrate on the not self intersecting ones. Okay. Okay. Uh, however, this picture is just a picture of the loop evolving in flat space um, without any back reaction. But as I just mentioned a minute ago, uh, back reaction can change things. So we should take uh, some way of, uh, we should include this back reaction in some way. And we did this a few years ago. We did a toy model for back reaction, where um, uh, basically what we did was we simulated, uh, we took the loops from the simulation, we uh, sort of erased uh, part of their power at uh, small scales, and we look again if the loop uh, would be non self intersecting trajectory. Um, then, after we reach that non self intersecting trajectory, we smooth a little bit more and more and more. Um, and the result is uh, this type of picture where there are four different stages of this evolution. The first one, the initial conditions is the one top to the left. Uh, then this is the second one, the third one, the fourth one. So we can just see what happens. So this is the initial conditions. This is after we erased or we smooth uh, high frequencies. This is a little bit more smoothing and the final configuration, which is much more smooth, right? Now, this picture, I want to show you two things. One is visually, you can see that the loops are getting smoother and smoother as a function of each uh, of these videos. But also the important thing here, or most important thing is that the loop does not self-intersect. So no self-intersecting trajectories are pretty robust in terms of um, um, smoothing. So we were uh, concerned by the fact that uh, maybe non self intersecting trajectories are kind of fragile and that a small deviation from, from the initial condition by doing this smoothing would make the loop break into two. This would change the result, as I said uh, before, but this doesn't seem to be the case, at least for this type of smoothing. So you start with the loop over here with lots of small scale structure. And as you smooth it, you get to something which is very smooth. Now, from this, we did this for a thousand loops on the radiation era for all the different forms and sizes. And from there, we compute the histogram of different values of gamma, the total power. Okay. And for different values of the different steps of this uh, smoothing evolution. And as you can see, this uh, uh, histogram is peaked around. Um, around 50. So again, there's a distribution of uh, values of gamma, but it's a good guess to take uh, 50 as the as the typical total power emitted by loops. We also computed the P of n, the actual uh, 
power spectrum at each different frequency and average over the, four, the, the, the full thousand loops. Now here I represented this average uh, power spectrum and multiplied by n to the four thirds to notice uh, something that is that uh, when you go to very high frequency, uh, this goes to a flat plateau, which means that uh, P of n asymptotically goes like n to the minus four thirds. So at, in this picture uh, for this toy model, uh, the high end uh, of the spectrum is dominated by the cusp, the cusps from the loops. You can see this if you look at this movie, which is the end result of one of these loops. You can see that it's very smooth. The loop is not, not completely smooth, but um, I mean, it's not just a circle, but it's, uh, it's pretty smooth. It's not self-intersecting, it's periodic, but also you can see that uh, the color of the string at some point becomes really red. And this is supposed to represent high velocity. So there, there, there's the cusp, okay? And in fact, there's gonna be another one on the other side here, it's harder to see, but it's there. So there are two cusps. Um, so one of these points, oops, let's see if I catch it in the right time. Yeah, it looks almost exactly like the one I presented you earlier, right? So that means that I can start with the loop from the simulation. I smooth it and at the end, it seems that what I end up is a pretty smooth loop with cusps, okay, larger scale cusps. These are important because, as I said, they could produce a narrow beam of radiation, so this could be important for detection. This complicated things because if you look at the uh, spectrum of, in, uh, around the loop um, and you color uh, the celestial sphere around the loop with the radiation that comes out of the loop, you see that it's, uh, it's pre anisotropic, right? And this can also have important consequences for, for the loop evolution, but also makes the, comp the calculation of this uh, gravitational radiation a little bit harder because it's not uniform, of course. So, sorry, the, what, uh, can you explain better this plot, this angular distribution, where is the string? So what is this? Uh, oh, the string, would be, the string would be in the center of this sphere. So what I'm doing here is putting the loop in the center, uh -huh. then making a sphere around it and say, in which direction do I get radiation? So ah, okay. you see that it's all concentrated in this region because in fact, well, I should have put it, should put it in, ah, okay. I should have rotated, but it's this region, the region where I have most of the radiation coming from a cusp is this one. Okay. It's a beam. Exactly. The beam. Exactly. Like a beam. Yeah. Sorry, one question here. So um, if the, is this observable? I mean, if there is like a, a lot of radiation emitted from this cause, can it be uh, traced uh, to the fact that it was emitted from a cost or, or not? Say it again. Yeah, I mean, uh, you are saying that uh, at the moment it has a cost, it can emit a radiation at this, uh, well, this uh, gravitational waves in this uh, direction. So I am then uh, thinking that then this effect is indeed observable. So is that the case? Or? Yes, yes, it could be observable as a burst of gravitational radiation, mm -hmm. which, which has a template, which is very different from the one from black hole binaries, for example, for example, or any other binary. So people have calculated these templates and, uh, and people look for this in different observatories like uh, LIGO and Pulsar Time and all this. Uh, of course, they haven't found any of these uh, observations yet, but yes, it's, uh, I mean, it, it is a target for observing cosmic strains. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in, in the way that we were proceeding, we were trying to calculate this. We needed these two ingredients and we have them both. So we can proceed and calculate this integral, which as I said, is the amount of any, or the fraction of any density in gravitational waves as a function of frequency. Okay, and this is the result. This is this omega as a function of frequency. And this is represented for different values of uh, G mu, which is the tension of the string. So the higher the tension, the higher you are in this picture. Remember uh, the granify theory is 10 to the minus six. So I'm here plotting it from 10 to minus eight to 10 to minus 14. These are very light strings. 
Okay, and these are heavier. Now, this spectrum has different uh, properties, which you can see. When you go to very high frequencies, this becomes very flat. Uh, this is the contribution from loops which are produced in the radiation era, and they produce the gravitational waves in the radiation era. And then there is this bump on the lower end of the frequency band, which is the uh, contribution from loops which are produced in the radiation era, but they decay in the matter era because, you know, as I said, from the point that they are produced, they oscillate many, many times until they decay. So uh, there are loops that are produced in the radiation era that are also emitting during the matter era. There is also a contribution from loops which are produced during the matter era that radiate during the matter era, but uh, for small values of GMU, the contribution is uh, much less important. Okay, so uh, another thing that I want you to pick in, to, to realize in this figure is the huge range on the frequencies here. Okay, it goes from 10 to minus 10 hertz to 10 to 10 hertz. Now, this is one of the great or the greatest things of, of strings. This is, of course, due to the fact that you, you produce loops of all these sizes from the early universe till today, right? Keep constantly producing them, and they are going to produce gravitational radiation at different frequencies because of their different sizes. Now, this is great for, for observation because this, uh, this spectrum covers all the bands of uh, different observatories uh, from the very low uh, frequencies of pulsar timing to the intermediate ones of uh, LISA to the, to the ones by, by LIGO. Um, but as you can see from this picture, it's clear that the pulsar timing are the ones that are gonna be the most com uh, competitive ones because well, the spectrum is higher in that region, okay? So uh, we, can put we can put some bounds uh, on this value of GMU by the fact that the pulsar timing array has some bounds on upper bounds in gravitational waves. So uh, let me just very briefly, because I think I'm running out of time, uh, describing what, uh, what, what pulsar timing uh, array observations are. Uh, basically, uh, these uh, collaborations, what they do is they monitor the arrival of the pulses from pulses, or many of them, uh, the arrival to these pulses to Earth. And because gravitational waves passing between us and the pulsar can uh, produce a a distortion of this arrival uh, time of the pulse, uh, we can put some limits on, on the amount of gravitational waves uh, that pass in between us and the pulsar. Uh, these are sensitive to very low frequencies, 10 to the minus uh, 9 hertz. And a few years ago, we put some constraints on the value of GMU just by using the data of uh, the different pulsar time and observatories. And what the important message here is that GMU from those uh, upper bounds for pulsar time and arrays is that GMU is, is of the order of less than 10 to the minus 11. So it's, remember that granified theory was 10 to the minus six, okay? So this is implying that uh, if you have a phase transition that produces the strings of the kind that I was I've been talking about at the granified theory, that theory is basically ruled out, okay? And we put a limit on this possible scale, which is much lower, 10 to minus 11. This also means that these strings cannot be seen in the CMB because they are too light to be able to produce perturbations that you can see in the CMB. Um, okay, here I have some results from Nanograph. I don't know, how much time do I have? I mean, you can take your time. <laughs> As I said, probably I need to run, but you can take your time and just you can finish. <laughs> Yeah, one. Okay. Okay, so I'll I'll continue for a few minutes then. Okay, the interesting thing is that um Anograph uh, produced some uh results from the 12.5 uh, uh, years of observation and they produced this figure here um where instead of producing um um uh, bounds for the st stochastic background uh, what they parameterized was this stochastic background by by this characteristic strain of the gravitational wave in terms of uh, some amplitude and some uh, index or or power law. And in this two-dimensional plot of the amplitude versus the the spectral line, 
uh, they put the one sigma and the two sigma um, contour plots of their data. So we can, we can now compare uh, to our model because we can uh, obtain from the typical strain or strain of the gravitational wave, we can compute also omega. So the result of omega would depend on this amplitude and this spectrum in this as well. So now the question is, since we have a model that produces uh, this stochastic background, and we have constraints on this amplitude and this spectral index, uh, can we put some bounds on the model of cosmic strains? And this has been studied by, uh, by several people. Let me just explain the, the, the paper that I've been involved with, which basically um, assumes that um, the most important uncertainty in the calculation is the fact that we don't know for, for certain the spectrum of individual loops. I mean, I told you that I could calculate it for this toy model, which is the one described here, BOSS. Uh, but as I said, it's a toy model, so there could be uh, uh, differences. Uh, I mean, could be not the, the whole real thing. So we took uh, this uncertainty and we uh, basically uh, used different values or different forms of this power spectrum. One that is dominated by cusps, one that is dominated by kings, or one where all the energy in the loop is radiated in the lowest mode, uh, the fundamental mode of the string. And from these different models, we computed the value of omega, uh, the spectrum of the stochastic backgrounds. And from there, we infer the values of the amplitudes and the spectral index that, uh, uh, that the uh, nanograph have contours for, right? So these are the contours of one sigma, one and a half sigma, and two sigma. So the interesting thing is that these models uh, of cosmic strings seem to be pretty good uh, in the sense of uh, producing a spectra, which is uh, crossing, uh, going across this uh, two sigma and one sigma area for different values of GMU. Okay, sorry, for different values of GMU. Um, so of course, with data, we cannot tell which one is, uh, is best but we can put some bounds on the value of G mu for the one sigma range, for the two sigma range. I mean, it's uh, typically of the same order uh, uh, as the one that we had before. The log of G mu is the order of 10 to minus 10, or 10 between 10 to minus 10 and 10 to minus 11, okay? So, uh, sorry, uh, these, these three categories, the kinks, uh, the cusp, and the mono, they can yes. kind of encompass all the possibilities? Yeah, the, the idea is that uh, yeah, the idea is that we think that the real power spectrum is somewhere in between here. Yeah, so it, it, you, you capture the the largest uh, variation, let's say. That's what we were trying to do exactly. I mean, of course, uh, situation could be different, but we don't think it's going to be that different from this. So it's give us giving us some idea what is the possible ranges uh, of the power spectrum. Okay. Um, okay, let me just skip this. So this is again the same picture, the gravitational wave uh, stochastic background spectrum as a function of frequency and for different values of GMU, okay? Now what I, uh, the reason why I'm plotting this figure here is to tell you that, okay, we have a bound from pulsar timing on GMU 10 to minus 11, okay? So, Unfortunately, that means that LIGO is not very, is not very competitive uh, compared to this bound from pulsar timing. So we don't we do not expect to see a stochastic background coming from cosmic strings in LIGO. This is one of the messages. However, if uh, the result from pulsar timing is indeed a gravitational wave, and if it comes from cosmic strings, then the good news is that we have a huge amount of signal for future observatories like LISA, right? This is the LISA band sensitivity curve. Uh, so your LISA would be able to see uh, a signal without any problem if GMU was 10 to minus 11. In fact, LISA could see uh, the signal even if you lowered the G value GMU all the way to 10 to minus 17. Of course, for Big Bang Observatory and also Einstein Telescope, which I haven't plotted here, 
uh, we still have a lot, a lot of values of GMU that we could observe. So the, the message to be learned here is that because the spectrum of stochastic background covers such a huge amount of frequencies, um, pulsar timing are the most sensitive now, but in the future, we will see it in different bands. And of course, if we were able to see the, the spectrum at two different uh, bands, for example, pulsar timing and LISA, and they are consistent with this spectrum, this would be a huge um, boost to the idea that maybe we have observed cosmic streams. Okay. One naive question. Uh, if you yes. can go back to one slide, um, please. Sorry. Could Sorry. you go back uh, one slide? When is when well, is one slide? Yeah. You go back. Can you go back one slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Slide. Ah, yes, thank you. Or, yeah, that's fine. That I um, it's very naive, but the one sigma contour of this nanograph mm -hmm. uh, seems like diagonal uh, from uh, top left. Uh, the top left uh, corner to the other corner diagonal yeah. but the profile of the cosmic uh, string it just crossed oh. it so it shouldn't right, be sorry. like inside kind of uh... right now sorry sorry this is i should have explained this a little bit better uh, the fact that there are lines here is because we are uh, plotting the result for different values of gmu so basically uh, for each so imagine that you take one value of GMU, you get one curve here, right? And then what you do is you look at the value of the power spectrum or the form of the power spectrum at the, at the frequency of the pulse, pulse of timing. Uh -huh. From that, you get the amplitude and the slope. So it's for one value of GMU is one point in A gamma. So it's just one point. So for 10 to minus 19 is right here. For 10 uh, to minus 10 is here. I so, thought it was like a line, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, it's, uh, so for each model, for each value of the tension, it's just one point. Okay, I get it's it. Not, okay. It's, not that you, it's not that you have to cover the line uh, for the single model. Each model is just a point. Mm -hmm. I get it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so this is again the same point here. Uh, if I look at uh, the values of uh, GMU that are consistent with the data from the uh, nanograph data from 12.5 years, and I look at the LISA band, you see that it's a huge uh, signal. So if this turns out to be right, we would be able to see it in LISA. Okay, of course, uh, uh, pulsar time in array uh, data is very promising, uh, but it, first of all, it has to be confirmed that it's a gravitational wave observation and not just something else. Uh, the good news is that uh, we also have some other evidence from uh, uh, hints that there are gravitational wave signal in other uh, um, pulsar timing uh, observatories. And uh, as I said, in the future, um, um, we could see it in other regions of uh, different uh, observatories. But before we do this, we should be able to uh, reduce the uncertainty in the sort of uh, theoretical expectation of the spectrum. So we should be able to, to, to narrow down uh, the spectrum of uh, loops and not just say, well, I don't know, it could be cusp, it could be kinks. We should be able to do this because we have the simulation. We just have to implement real back reaction. And we have been studying this for a few years now. Of course, this uh, back reaction is, is numerically very complicated. Because basically, what you have to do is you have the wall sheet here in, in, in orange and in, sorry, in pink. And if you want to know what is the effect of the gravitational back reaction, you have to look back from each point in the wall sheet back into the wall sheet uh, intersection with the light cone of that point, and, and then see what is the effect of uh, gravitational waves produced at that point in the, in the observation point. So this is, uh, this is complicated numerically. Uh, so this is something that I said we've been working on in the last few years. Um, I can show you some very preliminary work where we see that um, doing this calculation with real back reaction, the total power of loops decreases with, with the time. Um, so the gamma values may start with very large values, but then eventually 
all this uh, gravitational radiation smooth, smooths out the loop a little bit and the value of gamma decreases. Um, so this is, oh, again, simulations of a single loop. If this is the, the blue is the original initial conditions. The yellow is the 50% evaporated and the 30% is, sorry, the, the red one is the 30% evaporated. Um, sorry, the other way around. The yellow is the 30% evaporated and the red is the 50% evaporated. So these are just, as I said, preliminary works. Just to tell you that um, we, we are hoping that uh, we can uh, compute again this picture of the gravitational wave spectrum as a function of frequency, but now take into account real back reaction. And the question is how much is this going to change? We don't think it's going to change much, but we have to check mostly because if there were if there was an important amount of fragmentation, the picture could change dramatically. If this power spectrum changes, well, maybe it would change a little bit, but as I said, not probably too much. And also we want to check how many of these cusps occur because we want to also have some idea of how likely it is that we can observe these bursts, okay? Okay, so let me just conclude by saying that I hope I convince you that cosmic streams are interesting because they are predicting the many models um, which are extensions of the standard model. We have worked uh, in the last few years to get to the point where we are pretty certain of uh, the results of cosmic string simulations in the number density of loops. Um, the only new ingredient that we know that we should include that we haven't is the real back reaction for loops that would change the power spectrum, as I said before. Uh, but this hopefully is coming soon. So stay tuned for that. Um, so uh, there is a very interesting new data coming from nanograph, 12.5 uh, year data that hints to the possibility of gravitational waves and cosmic streams are a great candidate for that. Of course, there are astrophysical candidates which are probably, um, well, less speculative. Um, but uh, if we were to confirm that there are some uh, data in the pulsar time band um, that is consistent with cosmic strains, uh, the good news is that uh, we could confirm this idea in future observations from LISA or Einstein telescope because the spectrum extends all the way there. And of course, the spectrum from astrophysical sources does not. So we have a way to distinguish them by looking at two different observatories. Uh, the observation of cosmic streams would be huge for high energy physics, of course, because it would tell us something that we cannot do in, in accelerators. Uh, and even the lack of it also tells us a lot because it constrains models that, uh, that we are thinking of for, for, for the early universe. So I hope that uh, I convince you that this is an interesting source that is worth uh, studying more in the future. So thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, Liliana had to leave. Uh, right. So uh, are there any questions or comments, both in the room or from the online audience? Uh, Actually, yeah. uh, can I ask you a question? Please. Uh, yes. Um, so you talked about um, the the anisotropy of the um, the cusp, uh, which actually makes very narrow uh, the the angular distribution, right? Yes. Um, so if you consider uh, many cusps from many other strings, uh, mm -hmm. then um, actually you have many of those anisotropies, right? Yes. Um, yeah, but in terms of observation, I mean, what, what makes the difference? I mean, if you have many anisotropies that right. uh, may yeah. seem to be, you know, uh, just isotropy in some sense. Right, so this is exactly, you're, you're exactly right. So this is the idea of saying that I have an stochastic background, which yeah. are produced from cusps. So the idea is that, okay, the individual uh, power spectrum is the one described from a cusp, but you have so many of them that you basically have the stochastic background because you are convoluted all the contributions, right? right. 
I think this is exactly what you're saying. Even though you have bursts, you have so many bursts that they overlap each other, and at the end, it's in a stochastic background. Um, the another question is, um, I don't expect to actually uh, observe any um, the polar radiation from these sources. I mean, the polar radiation of the gravitational waves. Um, but um, but is there any possibility that actually might cause some polarization? Um, I mean, during the evolution of the strings or, uh, and during the, the formation of the cusps. Um, uh, they look just random. Um, yes. To me. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I haven't thought too much about this, but uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting question. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Can I ask also? Yeah. Yes. So I have actually two questions. What one is the what is the equation of state parameter? The you know, four strings. Can you say about that? Equation of a state. Um, ah, you mean if you were dominated by uh, strings? Yes. Yeah. So the pressure. I'm asking for the pressure actually. So if you have a fluid made of a strings. Um, I don't remember now, but I think it's, I don't remember now, it's minus one third maybe, I don't remember. But uh, mm -hmm. let me just uh, clarify that uh, in, in, um, in, in any of these models that we are talking about here, uh, we, we don't have uh, any moment where the universe is dominated by the any density in the strings. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, yeah. density, the any density in strings is subleading all the time mm -hmm. um, because because of this scaling solution, um, the any density the ratio between the any density and in, in strings and the any density background is proportional to g mu. And since g mu is so small, uh, this would never become mm -hmm. uh, a strings dominated universe. If you want, okay. and. I mean, I have a, a bit uh, technical question. So at the beginning, you had this uh, for the number of attraction, uh, you had this uh, uh, gauge for the uh, diffeomorphism, such that x dot square plus x prime square equal one, right? Wait, Apart just... from the orthogonal condition. Yeah, x dot scale plus x prime. Scale. Yeah, here uh, you passed. Uh, yeah, uh, no. There is a x dot scale plus x. Yeah, this one. Yes. So this is uh, actually uh, different from what is normally taken for uh, string theory, where this yes. is zero rather than one. And your cusp analysis uh, highly depends on this choice one. So I'm a bit confused. Can you have uh, any comment? Yeah, the, the um, let's see, the gauges that people use in the string theory are um, are normally designed- This is not the... one, this is zero, and it's called conformal gauge. Mm -hmm. I think, I'm not sure it's zero. I mean, it, uh, can it be zero? Yes, uh, so there, in terms of- not... These are not four vectors, okay? These are yeah, I know, yeah, ten vectors. Well, yeah, uh, this is not four vectors. Say it again. This is not four vector x. These are not dot... four vector. X is a three vector. Ah, uh, you have a time separately. Yes. So time is tau. So I should have ah, said that. Too. You you have that case. I see tau yeah. equal x to zero. Yes. Yes. I think. Okay. Uh, I think the difference is that if you look at the gauge that people use in the string theory, they are. They are very good to compute the spectrum of a string, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not so good to find the position of the string because, as I said, x zero, uh, the x of the four vector zero, is not aligned with time. Mm. So this is very important for us because we want to say, well, in this wall sheet, I want to take a cut at some particular time and see what the string is, and this is this x as a function of sigma and tau, mm -hmm. right? Okay. If you, yeah. if you, if you find uh, the normal gauges that people use in string theory, you and you would say, well, let me just 
talk about this object at the, the this particular state that they are talking about what is the classical position of the string it's not easy to to do because mm -hmm. it's not projected over this gauge where x0 is just is just uh, the time but x0 is a combination also of sigma and tau so it's like a very convoluted hypersurface uh, on this world sheet mm -hmm. okay thank you slightly different uh, gauges it's kind of curious because i think uh, um, these gauges are very natural for classical mechanics of the string but not so much for the for the quantum computation which is what people are interested in, mostly in, in the calculation of the strings thank you yeah. any other question Okay, if not, uh, let's thank uh, Jose again for his very nice talk. Thank you. It would be very nice uh, to have also a, a copy of your slides so that we can give okay. a second. Yeah. You, can, you can have a look at it and then ask me questions later by email. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, uh, so thanks a lot and uh, thanks for joining this event.